Welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. My name is Sean Finder, and I'm with my host Ollie Whitfield. This show is brought to you by AutoClose, a vanilla soft company. Ollie, why don't you introduce today's guest, or even better yet, just what we're going to be talking about today? Hey, what's up, everybody? So, back by popular demand, another Reddit video, but this is quite fun to do, and I think maybe we'll do a customer success version of it too, and. Maybe send us a DM if you want us to do a different type of topic, but there's plenty on Reddit, let me tell you that for sure. There is an unlimited source of uh, entertainment on Reddit. So I've got some uh, some questions in the startups Reddit from uh, from founders about anything to do with being a founder, CEO, and I want to get our takes on it. So um, you feeling good? You feel ready? Let's jump right in. All right. I know it's 9 a.m. I don't know if you've had a drink yet, so... We'll see how I have not had the around. coffee, but I do have the water here, so we're we're hydrated. Right. That's good. That's good. All right. So we'll start off with potential customers are asking me for a product demo, but I don't have one. What do I do? So this is quite a long one. I'll skim read a little bit. Um, I just wanted to see if there's any market um, marketing stuff I need for this kind of problem. Um, so I've reached out to a bunch of businesses about the app that I'm building. The only problem is there is no app yet and it's not quite close enough to MVP that I can show it off. There's no design wireframes or anything apart from very messy diagrams, which I have made myself. Um, as far as his own coding skill, uh, his or hers, they're still working on the login page and it's not coming along too fast. So um, is it too early? What can I do if so? Uh, that, that's a tricky one, Sean. I'm, I'm going to give this to you first. Enjoy. To, to me, to me, it's not that tricky. Um, what I personally would do in that case is I have no designs, I have no demo, I have nothing. Is use your voice. I would give that person a call and say, "This is what I'm planning on doing. This is the plan I'm doing for each of the pages. What do you think you would like, or what feedback would you give?" And then it's a perfect time because now that you haven't done the designs, you haven't spent any of that development money on it. You can actually get real feedback from real prospects. What I would actually do is I would take five to ten of your your people that are interested, friends that could be or it could be just random people that are interested. Have a call with them, a 30, 45 minute call with each of them and write down everything they want. And then if you see three to four different things out of those 10 calls that the same people want, well, you better make sure that your designs for your new platform has those in there. So I think if you don't have something visually to show somebody, you know, word of mouth. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. And, and as I read a little bit further in detail, they're, they're kind of describing a little bit what you said, but not quite in the scope that I I think even I would go further than what you said. Um, so they're asking initial customers or, or would-be customers to be design partners in that kind of sense. So they're saying, look, what would you do with this? How would you like it laid out? That kind of stuff. And then, uh, then they can build it. I would also just say, like, forget the word demo it isn't a demo you're not demonstrating it you're just ideating basically you're, you're kind of conceptualizing um market research probably is what i would sort of put it put in your mind this is what you're doing and then you you're going to get a totally different outcome from that phone call so maybe not even 10 people like get 20 30 40 50 if you can do it icps and just have a call them it doesn't matter how long it takes you as long as you can keep getting that feedback because what, what you don't want is like your best friend saying yeah i love it it's great amazing and that's really like biased feedback and you're just kind of going to go down a rabbit hole you want as much broad ranging circumstantial contextual feedback as you can get that makes a bit more of a a proper reading of what people are going to want and then you can go from there and they're kind of saying i feel like i'm not moving fast enough but also i don't want to just rush into doing it and it's not really going to land so i do as much of that as quickly as you can and Quite often that I get reached out to by people doing that, especially marketing technologies. They they want to like check with marketers what they see, what actually are their challenges and how their idea might be different from what is actually occurring for, for people they want to sell to. And even things like what market should I sell to and, you know, um, should it be an enterprise thing uh, or, or could it be a small business thing and how could it work and all of these types of things. You just need to get as much of that as you can. And well, I think before you know it, a lot of your question there will become kind of answered for you, you th those feedback slowly start to build the bricks i think yeah and I, I would say the word you're looking for is validating your idea yeah yeah i think you got it that was a good one good starting off one uh, so the next one we've got is could be uh, could be fairly similar so what to do if my idea is validated not implemented yet but could be easily replicated by big players 
I've got my idea, I'm ready to build it, it's underway, but I worried that someone else who's bigger or with a, a more extensive development team and more market reach can just take what I'm going to do and do it better or quicker. So that's a, you know, that's something that I early on had with even exchange leads and even auto close is a, f- a lot of people are scared that somebody else has done the idea, but they don't understand that the markets are so big that they can have three, five, seven players in that market. And you could still have a good lifestyle business sometimes you know, doing millions and millions of dollars. So I went, I, I think the misconception is people always say, oh, well, it's already done before. Well, you can always do it better. Now, here's a strategy that I use personally that I'll, uh, I'll give some, a little tip to everyone is what I would do if this was me is I would go to those two big guys that you say are your top competitors. I would go on G2 Crowd, Trust Radius, and all these different review sites and only look at the cons and see what are the cons and what people dislike about all those platforms. And then what I would do is I would make sure I have those cons in my platform. So then when you actually go up against these, you can say, well, do uh, does company A have A, B, and C? Oh, no, I wish they had that. Oh, well. We have A, B, and C. So what I would do is accumulate all those cons, all those improvements that these big guys haven't done yet, probably aren't even reading their their reviews, but you see them, take those reviews, build those into your MVP, and then go from there. But one thing I will say to the audience is never be scared to do an idea that's already done. That's like, you know, having a professional soccer football player and saying well i'm not gonna play football because there's already a you know there's already a messy like there's room for more than one messy there's room for more than one software in in the in the technology space always and if you read anything from sasta if you don't highly recommend it if you're anybody go to market based in your job or or if you want to found a company um they always talk about there's various ways to win even against the like global mega company like say if you made a zoom competitor you can still do well it's not like oh you know there's zoom that that's it it's not worth it it might be very difficult but at least you've got a market to tag on to that's one thing that it's not all bad but also kind of like you said there's going to be bad things and you can kind of latch onto them and use that as a pool that's one way you can always do things quicker so if they let's say picking on zoom uh maybe they're Maybe their chat feature isn't as good and people are demanding better of that. Go and build that quicker than them. Or you can pick a particular market that Zoom isn't providing too much of a service for. Maybe you want to sell to insurance companies if uh, Zoom isn't really known there. You can pick little segments like that. There's various ways of not just going up against them and selling to everybody because Zoom is a global brand. You can pick little markets, win that market if you can and it'll take time. And then you expand. They're like, that's how uh, I think it was DocuSign did it as well. They picked a market. They got close to dominating it. Then they picked two or three more. They built for it. And then they just kept repeating that. And then they became pretty much like the de facto uh, signaturing. I don't know what the word is. Um, e- e-signing, e-signature, whatever it's called. Yep. That's how they did it over time. So I think don't worry too much about that. Don't let it stop you from getting started. But just kind of be surgical in the way that you're going to plan to get under the radar and start to get some wins and you never know like if you start to take some customers especially doing your g2 idea they might say like oh shit like they're quite good like should we just buy them and then you got acquired like that's not bad either is it no it's it's never bad to get acquired if it's the right timing there you go all right we're flying through these so what's the next one (laughs) i love the title of this don't know how to proceed I'm a co-founder of a hardware uh, ag tech startup. I don't know what ag tech is. Uh, we'll find out. The other, um, Like the other two co-founders, I'm in my final year of college. It began as a project and, uh, and we've received a grant, a working space and all these kinds of things. Our MVP is currently complete and we've got a load of positive consumer feedback and we're very nearly finished. We've got a prototype. Our grant funds are finally uh, used in the development. We have one semester left, so we need to get some jobs or work out how do we do this? We need to return to a part-time schedule. Otherwise, we're, we're going to not have any cash, especially with uh, with student loans and all that kind of stuff. So what, what should they do at this point to keep it going but, but not let it die? So one thing, I am I'm a big advocate of education. So I would say do not drop out for that last semester. Uh, make sure you finish your school. Businesses, entrepreneurial ventures can always come, but you can only get, you know, education I think is one of the most important things um, to get. So what I would do is um, hire somebody. 
um, hire somebody um, to help you for that for that semester or that last quarter of your of your education have someone help you so that you can continue to grow the product while you're in school for that last little bit um and ad tech i think you mentioned all i think it's advertising technology i would believe a the ag not ad oh ag um, maybe agricultural or something like could that be agriculture sure. yeah um but yeah that's what i would do hire somebody i mean i know early on when i started my first business um i had a full-time job and uh, didn't really have time to really focus on it. So what I personally did is I, I mean, back then it was, I don't know, I mean, there's still Fiverr and all these other sites that I use Fiverr and it was um, Upwork, which was called something before that. Um, and I used that and I, I had an executive assistant running my social and I had somebody else where a developer working on my project while I was working a full-time job until, um, you know, you get that first few sales, you get that first few clients to say that they're going to pay and then I, I made the move. But the one thing I would do if I was in this person's shoes is do not skip out on the education. I agree. Yeah. And the thing about hiring somebody, I know you can say Fiverr where it's, it's potentially cheaper. If the cash flow is kind of a prohibitor for that, the one thing I would do, and it sounds like super hustle porny, so I'll, I'll probably get like canceled for this because it's saying hard work. But if there's anything you do, which is like you go out for a pizza once a Friday, you need to find a way of stopping those things which eat your time and your cash. Because any way you can put your head down for six weeks, anybody can do that. You can really focus on something super hard for six weeks. As long as you're being healthy and you're going outside and you're eating properly and stuff like that. Anything like that just eats away at your development, about the sales, you know, anything at all that you need to do. And, and your schoolwork is being a balance in that too. So it's a difficult one. Um, I think, like you said, the education is paramount. But I can see why you've got your eye on this so much, and it's it's an awkward one. But I think you've just got to find those little, you know, one percent of your time that you don't need to be spending. Like for me, I like to play a bit of PlayStation after work. If if this was me, I would have to stop that for a bit and just put my head down in this for a while. But that that's just me. Yeah, yeah. And there's always you know if you, if you need a little bit of money, there's always different avenues you can go. Family and friends, and and different avenues to get a little bit of cash to keep you afloat. Um, while you finish off your education nice all right so uh, we've got a couple more how do i test out a potential co-founder what would be some red flags some things to look out for to make sure it's going to go well and we're on the same page that's a good you know that's a great question me personally i always look at the people and i try and partner up with people that i know or i know their skills or i know their work ethic I know what their strengths are versus their weaknesses and my weaknesses and their, my strengths kind of are a little bit different than what theirs are. Um, but it's very, I've heard the horror stories about people having partners and getting taken advantage of. Um, you know, even, even personally, I was, I was best friend. Well, not best friends. I was very good friends with my co-founder. Um, and I've only met my developer at the time once and now we're very close, but you know, we met once and I remember, they combined for more than 50% of the company. And I was like, well, even though we're good friends, I know you guys decent, um, you know, you guys can kick me out of the business. So you want to make sure that uh, you choose wisely and you choose someone that compliments you. Um, so for example, in our case, he was a introvert developer and I'm the extrovert salesperson. Um, you want something like that, or you want someone that's really good with numbers where you're really good with operations. Um, so just find someone that compliments you and, and, and you'll be successful. But I would say the best way to do it is find someone that's either been there, done that before, recommended through a friend, or you know personally that um, you believe they have the skills. But it, it's sometimes really tough to find the right partner. Yeah, I think it's a little bit like getting married. You know, sometimes getting married can go wrong. Sadly, that's just part of life. And I think that's part of co-foundership as well. It's just not always going to be perfect. But as much as you can get away with it, I think there's a few things you could test out. So in the, in the latter part of their question here, they're saying, would it be good to do some contract work to test out the relationship? That personally, I would say is a no, um, unless uh, unless they've shown interest in doing that potentially. But I think you're looking for someone who's got the same mission as you yeah, and the same ideas of what they want to put in and where it wants to go like if they want to do a year and sell something and you don't then don't bother like you're just going to have a problem yep or if they don't want to build something quite big and that's your idea or if they want to be a lifestyle person and they're they've got a 
couple kids on the way or something like that and that's not quite your same trajectory that's a massive red flag um i just think that's it's a really difficult one you've got to find just same page what want to do the same things and then complement each other in, in that as well that would be my first bit and then my second bit but that that's a we need to do more of these these are quite difficult at yeah the moment. Uh, right, so I have another one that's been deleted. That's a shame. Uh, struggling with workload. I, I, I could talk to you about that all day. Um, so my next one is, what do you think is enough for me to prove product market fit to potential investors? That's a good one. Potential investors. I mean, it, it depends on, you know, right now where we are, the, the, they want to see they want to see actual revenue. Um, I always tell people, unless you have 10,000 in MRR, I wouldn't even bother going to an investor just because they're going to value so low. It's not worth the money and time you've put into your startup. So I say 10K MRR. You actually don't even have a business, I don't think, until you actually have 10K MRR. Um, that's my honest opinion. Um, but you know, then again, once you have that acquisition under your belt, I've heard stories. I, I spoke to a friend who um, raised $6 million after a PowerPoint presentation. So it's kind of one of those things where you got to get that belt around your waist. Um, the quicker you get that belt around your waist, the easier it is down the road to get that money. Uh, but initially, don't go too early. Um, start building those relationships, but don't go too early until you have something like. And one thing you might want to do, like, hey, I have a, I have this startup. Um, I think we're going to do it. You introduce to the investor and you say, listen, give me four months. I'm going to have this thing at 10k MRR. And then in that case, if you actually hit that number, that investor will be like, wow, this guy knows how to work. He's a hard worker and he might trust you more. But um, you don't have a business until you've hit that number. Yeah. And uh, I'm reading some of their questions. It seems a bit like they've not had an exit before, which would lead to, I think, well, maybe it's possible, but like a 1% compared to someone who has had an exit yeah. before. You're not getting six mil from a PowerPoint unless you've done it before. Exactly. They're more investing in you than they are the product at that point unless yeah. the product really could suck but um yeah they're saying things like would would an email list and a social following be enough no, no. <laughs> not at all unless it's a media company I, I don't think that's what they're talking about i'd be a unicorn you if that remember? was the case <laughs> yeah you know like your social media follower sean you'd be a zillionaire at this point but that's true yeah that that's that's a tough one i think like you said you need to kind of pre-sell yourself and then come yeah. back having proven your statement you need to say like six months time will be at dot yep and you've got to hit dot but then you might be a bit more credible and, and like you said i think it's probably you need a, a serious amount of dollar amounts to, to prove what you're doing there otherwise it's it's just a proof of concept it's not a proper it's not a know, business standing business yeah yeah right last one um love a bit of conflict Th this will be good for you co-founder leaving company with 10 percent equity investor perception my company has four co-founders and one is leaving with 10 percent equity we're about to raise a large seed round in the next few months of series a within uh, within 18 months of starting how much will investors non-vc care that this person is no longer with us and owns a significant percentage, will it be harder to raise or will they just not care? I don't think it'd be harder to raise. I think they're going to want to buy them out. I think they're going to say, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's buy out any, any one that's non-active in the business. So if you have any founders that are not active in the business, they're going to try and buy them out. So they would probably try and buy that up that 10% at a fair market value. Um, and then, um, reissue those shares. But yeah, it, I'm, I mean, there's one thing if you're going to have a silent investor who you're friends with, who's still giving advice and becoming an advisor. But if you just had a bad, a bad co-founder and he still owns 10%, get him out as soon as possible because he's just going to distract you along the way. Yeah, that would be the only thing I could foresee is if they're, if it's not a great relationship, then obviously you'd want to get rid of that relationship and just, you know, have a, have a blank slate. But if, um, what would you do here then? So I, I can see this as like a small possibility. The the round comes in and they're going to want to buy you out. And obviously at any round, you're going to have some sort of multiple on what the business could become. It's never, you are this, so we're just going to give you this. That's not really how it goes. What if they're kind of over pricing and they want something higher than what would be fair? Because then you can't really buy them out without extorting yourself. Yeah, I mean, there's there's different things you can do. There's you know hostile takeovers. There's there's a lot of different things you can do in that situation. I mean, if he's just going to be a silent partner that's going to sit there, you might not be able to get rid of him. 
Um, but if you give them a, if you give anyone you, anyone that's not in the business, you give them a fair market value. Um, typically, if they got into a fight with the co-founder, they're going to want to get out. But yeah, you know, every situation is different, I and mean, that could be an interesting one. Um, might just have to hold on and just be a shareholder. Cool. Well, we're out of Reddit, but I, but I enjoyed that. So I think we'll do a, a CSM one. Any other any others you can think of? We've done sales, we've done marketing, we've done founders. Yeah, I, I think you know, I'd love the audience to kind of you know DM us, add us on LinkedIn, let us know anything else you want to hear from us, and we can definitely build a show around that. Um, obviously, we're trying to build this show for you. Um, but yeah, give us your feedback on what you want us to talk about, what questions you want us to answer. And if you guys have any questions, send those questions over to Ollie, and Ollie will make sure to put those into our um, our presentation and our po- weekly podcast here. But um, that was really fun, Ollie. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I think maybe we'll do a development one as well. That, that might be a bit outside my uh, my strength, but uh, but you'll have to carry on that one. Perfect. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening here today. Um, and if you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to give us a five-star review wherever in the world you're listening from. Uh, and also, don't miss our next show. Thank you so much.